Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. Please remember to like and subscribe. Now today, we're going to be exploring the concept of integration. Now, we know that integration is defined as the reverse of differentiation. But when we integrate a function, what is it that we really do? To explore the concept of integration, we're going to be employing the use of the GeoGebra software here. So we're going to go to the input bar, and we're going to put in the integral. And I'm going to choose the option that says a function between two values. So let us say we want to integrate x squared plus 1. That's x squared plus 1. And my start value is 0. My end value is 3. So what is really happening here is that we have a part of the function, which is x squared. And the, the domain here given is from 0 to 3. Now, notice what happened here. What they did was to shade the area under the curve that is between the curve and the x-axis between 0 and 3. And here we are being told that we are actually getting the area, which is equal to 12 units square. Now, what is fascinating about this is that at some point in time, when doing some conceptual application in math, would have applied the use of the area under the curve. So technically, we would have actually used the application of integration already without even realizing that we would have done so. And what we want to do is we're going to explore a concept where we would have employed the use of the area under the curve to do something. If we remember doing kinematics, we know at some point in time we would have come across a velocity time graph. So let's simulate a velocity time graph here. So we have our graph and the x-axis we have time. On our y-axis, we have velocity, which is normally in meters per second. Let us say we have time in seconds. Now, let us say we give the object an initial velocity. And that initial velocity, we're going to call u. Let us say we give it a final velocity, which we're going to call v. Now, between the initial and the final velocity, this would have happened over a period of time. So we're going to have time on my x-axis. When doing a question of this sort, one of the questions that we're normally asked is to find the distance covered. Now, to find the distance covered, normally we consider the area under the curve. So we'd probably use dotted lines to close this. So what we end up with here is a trapezium. And we know, so technically speaking, we can say that the distance is equal to area on the curve. Now, because we have a trapezium here, we know that the area of a trapezium is equal to half the sum of the length of the two parallel sides, which we normally say is a and b times h, and h is the distance between the parallel sides. So when I look at this trapezium here, we can say that the sides would be this side here, which is u, and this side here, which is v. So the area becomes a half u plus v times the distance between them, which in this case is equal to time. So what we have simulated here is the formula for the distance traveled. So if we use v for distance, or x, we could say that x is equal to a half u plus v times t. And for persons who do physics, you would actually be familiar with this formula. So what I would, I would have done is move from velocity with time, and I would have actually gotten the distance covered or the displacement in this particular scenario. Now, since velocity is on the y-axis and velocity is the dependent variable, and x is independent, we're looking at the here, area here. Well, velocity, well, technically the graph would have been a change in velocity with respect to time. So when I find the area here, it is with respect to time in this particular scenario. So whenever we integrate, technically, we have to integrate with respect to a particular variable. But as you can see here, I would have moved from velocity to displacement. So that is one of the applications of integration. If I integrate velocity with respect to time, it produces displacement. And we can also find distance from that particular scenario. So can you think of how many more scenarios that would require this application? For persons who even do physics, you can further explore this concept. 
if we integrate force with respect to time, it produces impulse. And there are some other, much other applications that we would have used this in, where we actually have to find the error underneath the curve without actually using the application of integration. Now, let us introduce you to the symbolic representations that we use. Now, for integration, the symbol used is this here, right? And when we can use either use it with boundaries or we can have it without boundaries. So we could have a scenario like this where we have A, we have B. Now, in the first scenario, we call it the indefinite integral. In the second scenario, this is a definite integral, so we call it definite. Now, A and B are referred to as boundaries, as you'll have seen from the first scenario we did in GeoGebra. A is what is referred to as a lower boundary, and B is what is referred to as the upper boundary. To further consider this, what we're simply going to do is we're going to take a simple expression, we're going to differentiate it, and then we're going to attempt to reverse that process as the integration is defined as the reverse of differentiation. Before we explore the question, there is something important that I should point out right away. Now, when I'm integrating, and let us say we're talking about the indefinite integral here. When I'm integrating a function, I must integrate indicate what I'm integrating with respect to. So the dx here means that I'm integrating f of x with respect to x. Why is that important? Or why must I have the dx right there? Let us show you why. Now, let us say we have the integral of u x. In this case, we have two variables, which is u and x. Now, one of them could have been used as a constant, but because we're not told what it is with respect to, we can't know which one to treat as a constant. Now, in this case, if I were to put in a du, what it means is that I'm going to have to work with x as a constant, and I'm focusing on the variable, which is u, and vice versa. If I had the integral of u x dx, it tells me that u is a constant and x is my variable. So it is imperative that I indicate what I'm integrating with respect to. Let us say we have the function y equal x squared plus 4. And we want the gradient function. So I'm going to have to differentiate this. So I'm going to talk about dy dx. Now, when we differentiate the function where this polynomial is concerned, we know that we bring the power to the front. So I'm going to have 2 and we subtract 1 from the power. Now, of course, when we differentiate the constant, the constant goes away because we can look at the constant as 4x to the 0. So if we were to bring that 0 to the front, that would be gone. Now, integration is defined as a reverse process. So how can I reverse this process? Let me break this down. So dy over dx is equal to 2x. Now, I have the gradient function. And I want to go back to the original function, which is y. And bear in mind that y equal to x squared plus 4. We know that dy over dx is equal to 2x. Now, how do I reverse a process? Bear in mind that when I was differentiating, I brought the power to the front and I subtracted 1 from the power. Now, we want to reverse that. So the last thing we did is the opposite of that last thing we're going to do first here. Which means that we're going to have to add 1 to the power. And instead of multiplying, we divide by the new power. So let me write this symbolically now. So we can say that y is equal to the integral of 2x dx, which means I'm integrating 2x with respect to x. So we say y is going to be equal to the reverse. We, we add 1 to the power. The power is currently 1. So I'm going to have 1 plus 1. We add 1 to the 1. And we divide by the new power, which is 1 plus 1. Now, here's a big problem that we're going to have. How am I going to know what the constant was? Because when I differentiate a constant, I get 0. So there's no way of knowing what the constant was. It could be 1, it could be 2, it could be 3, it could be 4. It is 4, but we can't possibly know with this amount of information that we have here. It could have been 0 as well. So since we don't know, or we can't predict it, we're going to have to bring in what is known as a constant of integration. So we're going to have... A plus C right here. 
Now, when I break this down, I'm going to have y equal to x squared over 2 plus c, which is going to actually become, let me put it over here, y equal x squared plus c. So we get by the x squared. The problem would have been the constant. So I would need further information in order to determine what the constant is. And you can appreciate that because if I differentiate 10, I get 0. doesn't matter what constant I have. As long as I differentiate any constant, I get 0. So we need now what is called the constant of integration. So whenever we integrate without boundaries, we must add our constant of integration. So you can make note of that clear. So technically, if you understand how to differentiate, then you can generate the rules for integration. Right? So let's go right ahead. Let's start with the polynomials. And we're talking about the general x to the n that we just explored a while ago with respect to x. So we say for a simple polynomial of this form, to integrate, we simply add 1 to the power. My power here is n, so I'm going to have n plus 1. We divide by the new power, which is n plus 1, and we add the constant of integration, which is c. That is what we would have just explored. Now, let us look at a function, for instance, like cos x and sin x. Now, when I differentiate sin x with respect to x, what we end up with is cos x. So the determine, we can actually determine what the integral of cos x is from this. So we could actually say, let us integrate this entire thing. The integral of the differential of sine x with respect to x, of course, is equal to the integral of cos x dx. So we integrate both sides. Now look at the left hand side. If you differentiate something and then you integrate it, you're simply just going to go back to the original function. So I'm going to end up with sine x here. And remember, we have to add our constant of integration, which is plus c. So this is equal to the integral of cos x dx. So we can undoubtedly state that the integral of cos x with respect to x is equal to sine x plus c. So this is something we can add to our rules. So we can highlight this as a major rule too. We can now explore the cos x. What happens when we differentiate cos x? So the differential with respect to x of cos x is equal to negative sine x. So let us explore what happens when we integrate both sides. So once again, if we integrate the left-hand side, and of course in maths, you know, it's legal when you have an equation, as long as you do the same thing to both sides, then we don't have a problem. dx, with respect, we never leave that out, is equal to the integral of negative sine x dx. Now, once again, once we integrate the differential of something, I'm going to end up with cos x plus my constant of integration as a boundary. We don't have any boundary. Now, while we would not have explored this rule yet, the minus sign can go outside because it's a constant. And it is one of the rules of integration, just like how we explore limits and so on, where we can bring constants outside. So I would have negative integral of sine x dx. Now we can bring that minus sign to the left. So I'm going to have the integral of sine x dx is equal to negative cos x plus c. And of course, you, are, you might be asking me, why don't I have a minus c? A constant is what it is. Right? So the minus sign doesn't necessarily affect the constant here. So we'll just leave it as plus c. Or probably, I shouldn't probably say it like that because then I probably would have defeated the concept of doing the same things to both sides. So let me remove that plus sign here. Let me put a minus sign there. The idea behind it is that we can actually say let minus c equal k. So we can say that the integral of sine x dx is equal to negative cos x plus k. The conceptual idea here being that it doesn't really matter because it's a, con it's a constant. Right? So either way, I would get it. So we can also add this to our rules. So we have to know these basic differentials in order 
to integrate and probably we could also put in um the annex here because we know that when we differentiate so let me just draw this in when we differentiate so d over dx when we differentiate tan x with respect to x we end up with sec squared x so if we were to integrate we could actually say here put in the integral sign we know that when we integrate both sides of course with respect to x we're going to have tan x on the left and on the right we're going to have the integral of sec squared x dx so we can say that the integral of sec squared x dx is equal to tan x plus c all right so always remember your constant of integration plus c these are the most basic scenarios that additional math and theorem at unit one would actually require